you were fearful that somebody would come and kidnap you or murder you, rob you every day of the week, uh, and where you couldn't fit enough cash. I couldn't fit in enough cash in my wallet to buy an empanada in, in, in school or, or anything like that because of inflation and, and an ever decreasing quality of life. That was my childhood. You are listening to Breaking Boundaries with Brad Palumbo. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the show. Really excited to be bringing you guys a conversation this week with my good friend and former colleague, Daniel DiMartino. Now, Daniel is a Venezuelan expatriate and free market economist. He's traveled the country and done Fox News and been in the, the op-ed pages of USA Today talking about his experiences with socialism and why he has seen firsthand why capitalism is a much better system. Daniel, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me, Brad. Yeah, it's really good to finally be having you on because I've read your work for so long and we've talked and I've heard so much about your experiences. But just for our listeners and our viewers, uh, can you tell us what it was like uh, with your family in Venezuela growing up? Yeah. So, so everybody knows I, I'm 21 years old. I was born in 1999, the same year that Hugo Chavez took power. And, you know, I, I really had a, a very good childhood. I can't complain anything about that because I, I have a, a really amazing family. However, it was a childhood that's very different from what an average American can uh, remember, right? It's a childhood where you were fearful that somebody would come and kidnap you or murder you, rob you every day of the week, uh, and where you couldn't fit enough cash. I couldn't fit in enough cash in my wallet to buy an empanada in, in, in school or, or anything like that because of inflation and, and an ever decreasing quality of life. That was my childhood. And, and so it's something that I don't wish for anybody else. So when people think of socialism and Venezuela, they often think of Nicolas Maduro. But I've heard you talk about in the past how the story actually starts years earlier under Hugo Chavez. So can you walk people through the timeline of how Venezuela went from being a, a prosperous and free country to the really kind of disastrous place that it is today? Yeah, in short, the, the timeline is in the 1950s, Venezuela was the fourth richest country in the planet, just behind New Zealand, Switzerland, and the United States. After World War II, everywhere else was devastated, right? And we still have the largest oil reserves in the world that fueled uh, an amazing economic growth. People from all over the world, including my, my grandparents, uh, immigrated to Venezuela. But as the country became democratic in the, in the 60s, People started electing people who, politicians, who raised taxes, who imposed new regulations, who tried to give everything away for free, and, and the economy stagnated. Once Chavez came, he just doubled down on these policies to, to degrees never seen before, right? The government expanded and gave water, electricity, natural gas, uh, food, housing for free not just healthcare, not just education, absolutely everything you can imagine. And the government went bankrupt and our quality of life started diminishing. And, and that's how we got here, right? It was not a, a one day or a one year process. It's a gradual process of how socialism destroyed Venezuela. So one thing that you just mentioned that interests me is the fact that this was actually done at least at first through democratically elected leaders, right? This wasn't a coup, it wasn't a takeover, it was kind of a, a slow motion slide into authoritarianism. So can you talk about the transition from Chavez to Maduro and the disintegration of a democracy into an authoritarian state? Yes, this is why Venezuela is such an important example for Americans to know about because most other socialist countries brought about their socialist system by violent means initially, the USSR through, through Lenin and, and the revolution that came, uh, or, or Cuba through Fidel Castro. But in Venezuela, it was a gradual process uh, of, through votes. In 1998, Venezuela selected Hugo Chavez democratically. Uh, and then the first thing he set about to do was to change the constitution because constitutions are what socialists hate the most, right? Because it's a constraint of government power. Imagine what socialists would do in this country if we didn't have the US constitution, the Commerce Clause or, or the First Amendment or anything else. And 
So in, in Venezuela, what uh, the, the constitutional changes meant was an extended presidential term allowing for re-election, which was previously not allowed for the president. And uh, well, that Chavez used that power to take over businesses then, you know, that he took over the limitations in the constitution that required judges uh, to, to approve of those takeovers. And, and then as his policies started destroying the economy, say 2004, when we had a referendum against him, that's when the election cheating started happening. Mm -hmm. And so we saw that people voting, uh, we saw how people were threatened to vote. So somebody would go into the voting booth with them uh, and to total cheating in the elections. They would bust people to the polling centers with government resources. Uh, state TV would promote the regime. You were not allowed to campaign. The opposition could not put ads anywhere. It was a to total fraud. So what was it? What was the year when uh, Maduro took over for Chavez and how did that proceed? Yeah, he took over in 2013. It was a process that they did not want this to happen. Chavez died. Uh, he got cancer in 2011. He hid his diagnosis for long, but he had a really terrible uh, body reaction to his cancer. And so he couldn't hide it anymore because he was very visible. So he went to be treated in Cuba. <laughs> he didn't even get treated in Venezuela. Uh, this healthcare system he himself destroyed. And so when when he I was almost sure he was going to die before his last cancer treatment, he went on state TV and he said that Maduro is going to be his successor. No matter what the Constitution says, no matter what anything he says, he's going to be the successor. And so Chavez ultimately died and... Maduro, who was the vice president, took over, even though the constitution said that the, he was the president of Congress who had take over, to take over, by the way, but it didn't matter for them. And, well, they, they called for new elections in 2013, and they cheated again in those elections. This is not a recent thing, the election cheating. It's just that every time it comes in the news, people think it's recent, but this has been going on for over a decade. Yeah, so, and and... Can you maybe talk about Maduro is when things really started to go downhill. What were the key kind of policy changes, right? The running up of huge government deficits, the nationalization. What were the key ones that kind of pushed the economy over the edge? And what was it like growing up observing kind of your country uh, disintegrating around you? Right. I he didn't really do many changes with uh, the policies that Chavez had already implemented. What happened was that many of the consequences were uh, long overdue to, to occur, and then the oil price changes really precipitated the, the natural consequences of these policies. Much of the spending that Chavez was doing was fueled through increased government revenue because of oil price increases, right? When Chavez mm -hmm. took over in 1998, the oil barrel was priced at $10 per barrel. Starting 2006, he was enjoying 10 times the government revenue, $100 per barrel, $80 per barrel, $90 per barrel, until 2014, right? Mm -hmm. And even by 2014, inflation in the country was already about 100%. So this obviously the oil price had to do in the short term, not anymore, but uh, that, that allowed them to, to have some wiggle room uh, government-wise. Once they did not have that wiggle room and the government was already in debt because of the, the previous policies, Maduro did not change and do the reforms that were necessary. And so the country spiraled into even more inflation, right? And we went from 100% to 100% inflation a year, which is still insane. Uh, we have never seen that in this country in America, never. The highest rate America has ever experienced was 13% in the 70s. Um, we went to millions percent. It was insane. I could not buy anything. Everything was so expensive, changed every day in prices. I had to do lines for uh, to buy anything that, that, I, that I wanted. Toilet paper is a, is a famous one. Uh, I remember, if you want to hear this story, my, my dad was in the supermarket with me. And we had two uh, like plastic bags with toilet paper, and we were we passed it. With the the cashier charged us, and then when we were about to take them home, the cashier tells us, "Oh no, I'm sorry, I charged you one more. Uh, you can't take more than one bag. It's only one per per uh, customer allowed." And they, you know, they didn't count me because I was a minor, so minors can't buy things, right? You know, and. Wow. 
so what it, what ended up happening was that my dad just broke the bag. He's like, you know what? Keep your stupid toilet paper. And then we just left, right? Because there, there was police in the supermarket who would jail you if you did this. Completely out of their minds. Wow, that, that's crazy. Um, but so that's obviously a good example. But can you talk a little bit about just your personal life? What did you observe changing, at, like not in the news, but you personally? Uh, and how old were you during this time period when this was really happening? You were what, a teenager? Yeah, I was, you know, I remember things from ever since I was a kid. The first thing that I can remember of the economy and, and things that I experienced was when we didn't have milk at home for several weeks because there was a massive milk shortage nationwide when the government took over the milk processing facilities. Um, and I was, I don't know, 10 years old when I remember that. That was the earliest experience. So we're talking 2011, something like that. And... Now, by 2014, I was 15 years old, so I remember, you know, everything. Uh, but uh, the situation was much worse, too. So from doing lines in the pharmacy to buy toothpaste uh, for over an hour to having to put my fingerprint in the supermarket so that the government would check how much of my weekly quota was left for the items I needed to purchase. This was high-tech oppression. This is like 1984. Uh, a lot of corruption too because they didn't need to have the even the fingerprint readers but who produced the fingerprint reader uh, a government crook it, it's all to steal money it's all to to benefit themselves and so everything even little things that you wouldn't notice until you left were were not normal you and know what, I, I could, yes when did you actually uh leave and come to the u.s and what was kind of the immediate precipitation or um you know, preceding event for that? Well, I left when I finished high school. So I was 17 years old. That's the age that we have one year less of high school in Venezuela than, than in America. And I I had planned it for a while. That's what I wanted to do for ever since I can remember because things were not going okay in Venezuela. And it was an ever worsening situation. And I knew that I didn't have a future there. And I really loved the United States. I had read about Ronald Reagan. I had read about Milton Friedman. You know, I had traveled when I was younger here to America too, or at least to, to some parts, right? Not, not where I ended up living. And I, I love this country. So I wanted to, to make it here. And I applied to colleges. Uh, I started for the SAT. I took the SAT. And I ended up getting a full ride scholarship to go to Indiana University in Indianapolis. And obviously it was a no brainer to, to take it and, and to come here. So why did you end up studying economics? I think it was just the natural uh, consequence of seeing things that, you know, the things that most caught my attention that I wanted to solve the most was the hyperinflation that Venezuela was suffering, the, the shortages. Why do people have to make lines? Uh, reading books about how these policies were the same that were implemented in, in Cuba or in the USSR, and they led to the same consequences. What can I do? What can I study to improve the lives of people? And I thought that, and I still think that economics is the best path, and now I'm doing a PhD. <laughs> So what do you then uh, make of the fact that here in America, you came here, there's, you know, COVID, going back to pre-COVID times, because that's a little bit of a, a different circumstance, but there's uh, no lines here. There's no uh, finger fingerprint readers at the grocery store. No, right. So obviously we don't have a thousand percent inflation, but what we do have is a, a kind of prominent rising force in American politics in the Democratic Party uh, that is openly claiming the label of socialist that wants to spend $30 trillion, run the money printer. Uh, they want to nationalize industries like healthcare and like the internet and other uh, key higher education and, and honestly do a lot of these steps that to you, do they resemble what happened in Venezuela some years ago? Oh, it's 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 the same. It's the same things that they, they told us. And the thing that makes me laugh is that they tell now Americans that America is not Venezuela. When in Venezuela, we were told that Venezuela was not Cuba. And the Cubans were told that Cuba was not the Soviet Union. And it's a never-ending cycle of this time it's going to work and then it doesn't work and then this time it's going to work and then they just keep trying in different countries and it keeps failing and it keeps destroying our lives. So it's it's a funny joke, but but it has serious consequences for, for us. 
We but, don't want Americans to, to leave the country. In fairness, though, I, I look at people like AOC and like Ilhan Omar, who espouse these democratic socialist ideas, and they don't seem like bad people. They don't seem like they want to be dictators and hurt people or lock people up. They honestly seem like they want to help, don't they? Well, I think AOC, perhaps. I'm not so sure, actually, about Ilhan Omar, because she ha doesn't just promote these socialist policies. She also has defended the Maduro regime herself. Uh, and she has blamed America for the ills of Venezuela. Uh, and she thinks that it's U.S. sanctions, which are completely after even I left the country, um, what caused her or crisis. And she not only defends uh, the Venezuelan regime, she constantly defends authoritarian regimes abroad. So honestly, you know, I, I don't know them as, as people independently to vouch for their good intentions. Um, I do not think that Ilhan Omar is a good person at all. AOC perhaps, you know, who knows? I haven't met her. She doesn't seem to, to be bad, but I, I wouldn't trust Ilhan Omar if I was anybody. But what about the criticisms that that people would look at what what you say and they would say, okay, but hang on a second, what what Bernie Sanders and AOC support and your point's taken about Ilhan Omar, she certainly has questionable past, but ultimately what this movement wants is just to make us like Norway or like Sweden. They don't want to turn us into Cuba or Venezuela. I mean, are, are, isn't it fair to say that that's not the same thing? I think that if they wanted to turn us into Norway or Denmark, then they would propose the policies of Norway and Denmark. You know, this is a discussion that they, they always keep bringing up the, the point that we just need uh, socialized medicine like the rest of the developed world. But they don't want us to pay the taxes of the rest of the developed world. They feel the rich can pay for it. But the rest of the developed world don't doesn't fund their healthcare systems by taxing the rich because there's just not enough money there. They do it by taxing everybody. Sales taxes, very high payroll taxes, uh, not very high corporate taxes. Uh, they have a lot less regulation than we do on licensing, on zoning. So I think that if they were proposing the Nordic, mo the Nordic model, they wouldn't really be much of a threat. I still don't agree with that model. I think it, it has serious flaws. I don't want to live there but it's not going to turn us into Venezuela. Their proposals are so expensive and so unfunded by their tax, even their tax revenue increases, that it would bankrupt the United States. It will lead to a huge economic crisis of unemployment, of inflation, if they do what uh, you know, some of their economic advisors like Stephanie Kelton or even what AOC has suggested, which is just to print money. If you print money, you create the same thing that happens in Venezuela to, to uh, finance government spending by printing money. It's inflationary. Yeah, so this is a good point because you mentioned Stephanie Kelton and most people who are listening probably don't know who she is, but she's a Bernie Sanders economic advisor and she's a, one of the co-founders of something called Modern Monetary Theory. It's basically this pie in the sky, left wing economic theory that says governments can just print money, deficits don't matter, and there's just no limit other than maybe inflation someday out there, and that we can just solve the problems by just running the money printer. Is that what makes, I think, the, the, the modern progressive movement more dangerous? I mean, if they were truly recommending new spending and new policies offset by higher taxes, that would be kind of like a debate we could have. I wouldn't necessarily support it, but that, that is what Norway, like you says, said, has for a more of a welfare state. But when they're supporting a 30 plus trillion dollar Green New Deal and they only have a small amount of tax increases, because like you said, the, the math doesn't work. The rich can't pay for it. They're basically talking about just running the money printer, devaluing the US dollar, running up inflation. And, and is that what's so problematic about it? That's... In theory, it is very problematic. Uh, in reality, they are not going to succeed in taking over the Federal Reserve. It's a very independent institution, and and they're never going to have the majority in the in Congress to confirm people enough people in the Federal Reserve that are supportive of modern monetary theory to to do anything like that. But what they could do, though, is get the country in debt instead, or uh, to a point where interest rates would increase massively. And, and then the, the businesses would go bankrupt, right? Or they would increase the corporate tax rate so much that businesses would leave America so there would be much higher unemployment and people would be much poorer, like they are in countries like Spain or Italy, not like they are in Denmark or Sweden. Uh, in Spain, where the youth unemployment is 50%, 
This is pre-COVID, Brad. This is not the, the COVID crisis. Spain had a national unemployment rate, not, not the youth one, just the national regular, uh, around 14% before COVID. Wow. We only had over 10%. France were 10%. Is that what we want? No, America meanwhile, in the US, we, we were at what? 3.5% before COVID? Yeah. So I guess that brings me to kind of an interesting question because on one hand, we have this democratic socialist movement that's really taking over the Democratic Party, I think it's fair to say. Maybe not completely now. Joe Biden isn't himself a Marxist, but that's the direction of the party. Um, on the other hand, we have Republicans who are kind of, they're anti-socialist, but they're not exactly staunch free marketeers and fiscal conservatives, right? So when you look at the modern right, do you really see a home for fiscal conservatism or do you just see less bad? Well, I think in politicians, there's always a cost benefit analysis that we as individuals have to do when who are we gonna support, right? Uh, we're never gonna agree 100% with anybody. And, and so we just have to find whomever agrees the most with us and disagrees the least. And we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good either. Uh, so I think that in general, the Republican Party is much more for fiscal conservatism than the Democrats are. And yes, you know, it's not perfect. We're not going to balance the budget perhaps in, in many, many years, but we are going to do less damage to the future. Yes, you could say it's less bad in some sense, at least on the fiscal uh, sense, but in other senses, I think it's much better, right? It's not just about fiscal policy. It's about regulation. It's about uh, free trade with other countries that, well, until recently, the Republican Party was a party of free trade, not so much anymore. Uh, but but it is on, not just on the economics either. It's on the social issues. I'm, I'm pro-life. If you support uh, the, the right to life, then, you know, the Democrats are not really your, your people. Uh, and, and there's so many other issues, right? So voters just have to make their minds up based on, on, on that cost-benefit analysis of the policies. No, I don't disagree with you, but I think it is a harder sell to tell voters, vote against socialism by voting for the guys who will just grow the government a little slower and say things about the debt, but they won't necessarily do a lot. And it gets harder because like you said, the Republicans and conservatives in some camps, there are still a kind of a lot of staunch free marketeers, um, but in some camps, they're becoming this kind of nuevo populist, national, economically nationalist Republicans. So do, when you see people like Tucker Carlson, he, he, the Fox News host who's getting booming audiences and being talked about as a 2024 contender, saying that he likes the economic policies of Elizabeth Warren, right? When you have Senator Josh Hawley uh, saying that he thinks the federal government should regulate Snapchat and YouTube, what videos they can show you and how long they can have streaks for on your Snapchats. Uh, don't you see that kind of conservatism, if you can even call it that, as maybe not equally as dangerous, but as also a serious threat to free markets and prosperity? I think it's a very serious threat. And it's it's so unbased in any kind of evidence, in, in any kind of thing that America has done in the past either. Uh, where, where are we going to go back to protectionism, to not trading with other countries? Uh, that didn't work here. It hasn't worked anywhere in the world. There's nobody who supports that seriously in, in, in uh, the research, right? The problem and the reason I think of those policies of protectionism, of anti-immigration, of uh, just regulating social media, regulating companies, higher taxes even for the rich that now some of those people are proposing, they're not the first. Steve Bannon was the first one to say we should raise taxes on, on the rich. That's that's the people who, whom they're following. The I think it's coming from a place of hating big corporations who donate to liberals. You know, they hate big tech. They don't know anything about the economic effects of immigration. It's not even anymore about the cultural effects. It's all about owning the libs. No matter if that hurts me, you know, if, if that hurts you economically, if that hurts your neighbor, if that hurts your family, it doesn't matter. It's going to hurt the libs. So let's take all those immigrants who those companies want. Let's raise their taxes and let's destroy their economy for the sake of owning the libs. And that's ridiculous. But don't you think, though, that there is some merit to 
challenges to free market ideas. I mean, look at China and the way that they've stolen our intellectual property and raised, waged economic war on us. I'm a free trader, but don't you think that, like, what is the free trade solution to the threat of China, right? Do you think that just kind of unadulterated free market economics has all the answers to, to, to today's problems? No. Of course not, but it, it never has, and conservatism has never stood for that either. We didn't trade with the Soviet Union while the Cold War was happening forever. That there was a basically a trade embargo between the USSR and, and the United States, but the US was still up for free trade with everyone else. Well, the problem is these people are not just against trade with China, they're against trade with everybody. They're right. against they're for putting tariffs on Canada, on Mexico, on the European Union. Uh they are against immigration from everywhere, not just, uh, you know, people with ties to the Chinese regime. Of course, we're all against immigrants from, with ties to, to criminals, you know, that's, that's non-controversial. So why should conservatives support more legal immigration? I mean, you're a legal immigrant yourself. You and I are both pro-immigration, broadly speaking, but a, a broad swath of the Republican base and, and conservatives more broadly has become more restrictionist, even opposed to legal immigration. Why are they wrong? Well, there's there's two main reasons. Uh, one is the, the cultural reason and one is the economic reason. Those are the main uh, arguments against immigration, right? On, on the cultural side, it, find me one American who isn't... Uh, a descendant of an immigrant, right? It's it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. Perhaps on some Indian reservations, and even then, you know, it's it's hard. So that for then, if we we've had the experience for over two hundred years, and America is, is still a very very rich, a very very prosperous nation, why should that change in the future? In fact, today, immigrants to America have the highest English ability of anybody in the past. I can assure you that the descent that your ancestors and of any of your viewers, they probably didn't even know any English when they immigrated to America. They were Germans uh, or they were Italians and they didn't know a drop of English. They learned it when they got here. So the immigrants coming to America now know more English. They're more familiarized with American culture than before. Uh, and depending on where they come from, they not even necessarily tend to vote for the Democrats. You know, there's people from Cuba, from Venezuela, from Nicaragua, and the pro and even the Chinese, the Vietnamese, but Republic, some Republicans, not, not all of course, not even the majority perhaps in Congress, still oppose some of these people. So that's, it's just nonsense. On the what about the economic side, argument? Right, the, on, on the economic side, uh, they argue that they take away American jobs. That even through a simple logical test, does it doesn't even pass. Uh, they argue, you know, it's supply and demand. There's more supply of workers, so wages go down, right? But that's not how you do a, a, an analysis of immigration because workers are not just supply of their work and then they go home and stay home. They pro they complement other workers. They have human capital that they bring and they buy things themselves. To argue that immigrants take away American jobs is to argue that new kids graduating college take away the jobs of people who are already in the labor market. It's not true. They just create new jobs. More people means more jobs. We have now a 330 million population, yet the unemployment rate before COVID, you know, we're now in a spike, the unemployment rate is lower than ever before in history. How is that possible if we have a higher population? If, because immigrants are not different. This is just more people, right? Uh, Women entry into the female entry into the, the workforce since the since the end of World War II. That's a massive increase in the number of workers. Yet we saw drops in unemployment, not increases. What's the difference? There's right. no difference. It's a it's a zero sum fallacy, right? The idea that any as if wealth can't be created, it can only be redistributed. But in reality, when an immigrant like you comes and, and is a positive contribution to American society. You get a paycheck, you pay taxes, you go out and spend money as well. You're not just another labor uh, supplier. So I, I completely agree. But the US system is pretty broken. I think we would all agree. So if you could snap your fingers and change just a couple things about the US immigration system, what would they be? The, the main thing that I would change would be to end the caps on high school immigration. Right now, of the nearly 1 million immigrants that the U.S. admits on a, for a green card, a permanent residence, and then citizenship after a few years, 70% or 
700,000 are admitted just because they're siblings uh, or children or spouses of US citizens. The rest are either refugees or because of a lottery. And then just 140,000 a year, 14% of all immigrants come because of their skills through their jobs. Because a company hired them, they say that they're highly paid, they can contribute to the economy. And we want those uh, highly productive workers here. There, there are no American uh, who, who can do that job. That cap is extremely low, even compared to other developed countries. Canada alone admits more people on the basis of skill into their country than America, and they have a tenth of the US population. Even European countries, Australia, New Zealand, and in the US, there's over a million people who are already approved for their green card, and they haven't gotten it because of that arbitrary cap. There's people who age out of the system. There are, there's over 100,000 children who do not know any other country. They're legal immigrants. They're living in America, and they will be expelled once they turn 21 from their visa. It's insane, all because of this arbitrary cap. If we could eliminate that cap, which is something Congress can do easily, um, and they're now considering uh, actually legislation about that, the Fairness for, for High-Skilled Immigrants Act, that's one step. Uh, that would really be a big difference, not just in the lives of these immigrants, but for the U.S. economy. It would steal all those highly skilled, skilled workers from Canada, from Germany, from Australia, and it will bring them to America. And then all these tech companies could create more jobs for Americans here. Manufacturing companies could do more as well. And, and it would be a, great for all of us. Well, I think that's a good place uh, to leave it for our last serious question. So I, I'll transition and ask you about the thing I ask every guest on the show about, uh, what we're known over here for our food takes. So Daniel, tell us, what is your controversial hot food take? My controversial hot food take. Oof. Well, I think, I don't know, perhaps this is not controversial. I'm not sure, because, but I, I've seen some pushback on this. But if you like chocolate, you must like Nutella. There's people who like chocolate and don't like Nutella, and I don't understand why. Like, it's it's insane, right? Um, or am I... Well, I like both, but Nutella is like also ha has nuts in it. So I feel like you could like chocolate, but not like nuts. I don't know, man. Hazel, it's, it's hazelnut. The story of Nutella is amazing, by the way. You got to read about it. Uh, it's it's about it's it's an Italian uh, tradition that came out of poor people not having enough chocolate, and so they mixed it with the hazelnuts. But there's people who just don't like Nutella, and I don't understand them. Uh, I think it's the best uh, sweet thing that anybody could could get. And if they don't like it, you know, they're just I don't know out of this world. Well, there you go, Daniel DiMartino, <laughs> channeling his inner white girl and endorsing Nutella, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again uh, for joining the show. Thank you, Brad. All right, everybody. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for tuning in. And if you like this show, make sure you're subscribed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Go ahead and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts if you can. It really helps. We'll talk to you all again next week. You are listening to Breaking Boundaries with Brad Palumbo.